It started in Ohio. Me and my friends were coming back from a Friday night party. My friends were Ethan, Tim, Lori, and Jenna. We were in a Ford my friend got for his birthday. Ethan was the driver and me and the others were in the back. We were going the way our GPS was telling us to go, and then there was a path through the woods. While we were driving, we spotted a small tower to the right in a field. Being the curious teenagers we were, we decided to go inside. We all headed to the top and found out it was just some old archery training tower back a few decades ago. When we were about to leave, Lori spotted a door hidden at the bottom. We wanted to get in, but it was locked shut. My friend got some axe from the van and started breaking down the door. When we had broken it, we found another spiral staircase leading down this time. We turned on our phone light to guide the way, and we were going down. We, uh, Jenna and me, spotted a room at the end. We went in and we saw this, a wide cobblestone room covered with moss and dirt. We explored around, and I called my friends because I noticed something. It was a poster from some circus back in the 1900s. We clearly saw something behind it, so we went through it and what we saw was impossible. A small underground circus arena. We also smelt a horrible stench coming from there. We went to investigate and found a chest in the middle. Inside was the thing I would remember for my entire life, dismembered, rotting body parts. Also inside was a key, a rusty and yellowish brown color. Before we could pick it up, some old circus music started playing. We turned around and saw it, a deformed looking clown. It was about eight feet tall and it was holding a weapon, a huge claw replacing its hand. It was big enough to swallow someone and sharp enough to slice somebody. We all knew to run for our life. As we were running, I noticed that thing was still following us. We locked the door shut and ran out of there as fast as we could. We got into the car and sped away. We were all panicking and talking about what the heck just happened. I also remembered one last thing. And before I saw that key, I also saw a metal door at the back with a lock perfectly fitting the key I just saw. I don't know what was behind that door, but whatever it was, I don't want to find out. And I never want to return there again. I'm 20 years old and I suffer from insomnia. I also have sleep terrors, so normally nightmares come regular to me. But this one nightmare kept me up for over a day. I went to bed early because I had to pick up a package in the morning and I'm scared of the dark, so I leave the bathroom light on at the end of the hall. I also sleep in a single bed on the opposite side of my headboard. Don't ask me why, I just never really liked them. But one night, I finally decided to sleep on the top end of the bed, and to this day, I never did it again. I fell asleep and my room flashed red and I jolted awake, and then I fell back asleep shortly after. Now this was the first lucid dream I had had, and it felt like a new dream, but it wasn't. It was a nightmare. I rolled over and my foot was hanging off the bed, and at the end of my bed was a dark figure. That figure was wearing a trench coat, and it looked like it was wearing a cowboy hat or a fedora. And he said something that I could remember so clearly, because I remember moving my mouth, but I couldn't speak. The figure's mouth got extra wide and started pulling me in. He had large gnashing teeth, and I slowly felt like I was getting pulled in by my arm and by the time my arm was fully devoured. Normally people say when you die, you wake up, but I didn't. I went through this loop of dying and getting pulled off my bed and shredded multiple times. I could feel the agonizing pain more and more going through these loops. A doctor just continued to sit down with me, so I worked up enough strength to hold on to the other side of my bed, and the clocks that time said it was 4.30, and I went to bed at 1.00. So that means I must have died in my dreams at least eight to nine times. And I finally managed to end it by holding onto my bed and pulling myself and rolling over again because it pulled the mattress on top of me and I flipped it over with me when I finally survived a loop. It must have been 5.30 and then I finally woke up 
And the thing that scares me to this day is that I was on the floor and it was 5.30. And when I looked up to my right, I could see the dark figure, but it wasn't sitting. I bet it was standing next to the cupboard door. I was so scared and tired, then I immediately climbed on my bed quietly and just went back to sleep. I thought maybe it might have been a jacket because my jacket for work was black and I hung it up on my door. When I woke up, there was nothing there, and to this day, I always separate my nightmares and night terrors based on that dream. This happened on a summer night. I'm the type of person who likes having me time. It was about 1.30 in the morning, and I was sitting on my front porch admiring the stars and enjoying a nice cool breeze. I heard my phone buzz, so I sat down to check it. It was my cousin asking me what I was doing up this late. I forced myself to ignore it because it was me time, remember? As I looked up from my phone, straight ahead is my neighbor's house, and in front of a tree, I saw a little girl. She looked about eight or nine, and she had bright, thin ginger hair, and her hair was in two pigtail braids. She was wearing a white dress with red polka dots all over it. The dress went right to her knees, and it had white lace around the bottom rim. She was also wearing shiny black heels, almost like something a little girl would wear to a wedding. She looked so harmless. I stared at her for a solid 30 seconds with her staring right back at me. She didn't move, not a muscle. Then behind me, I heard a knock. I thought hearing a knock was weird because I live in a brick house. I turned around and there was nothing there. The wind wasn't even blowing anymore. I go to look back at the girl and she was gone. I was creeped out, so I went inside. A few days later, I was planning to list a few items on eBay, one being an old doll that I used to play with when I was little. I had the items sitting beside my bed so I could keep an eye on them. I'm getting ready for bed and I notice the doll is looking at me, or at least in the direction of my bed. So like any person would do, I turned the head and made it face my closet. The neck part is pretty stiff, so I wasn't expecting the head to move. I woke up the next morning and the head was looking right back at me. This time, I could feel it staring at me. I turned the doll around completely this time, and nothing else happened with the doll. The rest of the day, I just had this eerie feeling that I was being watched. Eventually, I had had enough of it, and I sat down on the edge of my bed, and I wanted to talk to whatever it was. I assumed it was the little girl from a few nights prior, because it was a doll that had moved out of everything in my room. I sat down and said, Hello. Is this the little girl from the other night? I didn't get an answer. So I changed the subject and said, Do you like my doll? Do you want me to keep it? Is that why you moved it? Again, I got nothing. So I sat in silence for a little while because I didn't know what to say. After about five minutes of sitting in silence, I looked forward and saw clothes in my closet swaying. I was so confused because there was nothing on in my room that would cause air to flow or a breeze. I spoke out and said, is that it? Do you want me to look in the closet? Then the clothes stopped moving. I was again extremely confused. I was going to get up and look at my closet, but as I was about to get up, I felt fingers creep on the back of my neck. I had goosebumps down my entire body, and I jolted up from my bed. I looked and nothing was there. This made me frustrated. It's like whatever it was was just toying with me or teasing me. So I stood my ground and I said, get out. You are not welcome here anymore. Leave. The eerie feeling of being watched instantly went away. I left the room anyway because I needed to be around people. Nothing has happened since. Anytime someone asks me if I ever had a paranormal experience, that's the first that comes to mind. And I feel like it always will be. For those of you watching this now, I would like to say this before you hear my story. If your parent or guardian never stressed the lesson of tell a trusted adult when you are in an uncomfortable situation, I am urging you to take this lesson seriously because I wish it was drilled into my head more. Because if it was, I know this experience would not have happened the way it did. The reason I am sharing this experience with you is because I am still seeking therapy for it to this day and probably for many more years to come. My therapist wanted me to finally go into detail of what happened that night, so I wrote this for them. But for the sake of privacy, I will be changing the names of those involved. 
Thank you. Now, let's begin with how it all began. This happened when I was 13 years old. My three best friends and I, who let's call Ella, Raven, and Jess, were having a sleepover at Ella's house since we wanted to watch the new movie in the franchise we were all obsessed over. Ella's house was the best choice since it was in between all of our houses and we would have the entire house to ourselves for most of the night. We planned out the entire night, as a young group of friends would do, but at the last minute decided to take a trip down to the Safeway that was about five or six miles walk from the house. Now, keep in mind that all four of us at the time were seasoned soccer players, so we could all run quite fast for a long duration of time. However, I was getting off of a pretty serious injury, so I couldn't run as fast or as long as I normally could, and I was a very conditioned runner at that time. Anyway, we arrived at the store around 4.30 p.m., I believe, and during that time of year and where we lived, the sun was still up, but it was going to disappear behind the mountain in about an hour or so. We didn't want to stay any longer than 15 or 20 minutes, since the walk back to her house would take more time since we would be walking uphill and carrying our grocery bags. We also didn't want to be left to walk home in the dark, since mountain lions and bears were common in her area. And if you know anything about living in an area like that, it was common knowledge to get inside before sunset. We finished our shopping and totaled about five or six bags to carry between the four of us. As we were about to leave the store, we heard Ella's name being called by one of the workers. Ella turned around and it turned out to be someone she knew. They chatted for a bit, but we couldn't really understand what they were saying to each other since they were talking in Spanish. Raven nudged Ella and said that we should go soon. So Ella said goodbye to her friend and we began to walk out of the store. I looked up and I estimated we had about 10 to 15 minutes of light left, so I said we should hurry. We began walking back home and as we were leaving, a ragged looking man approached us, asking for spare change or money. I was immediately hit with the smell of sweat, urine, feces, you name it, this man had it. I felt sympathetic for the man, since my family taught me to always be sympathetic to those less fortunate than us, even though we could have been labeled as lower class at that time since money was tight for us. I should also mention that since money was tight, my friends said that they would pay for my share since they had enough on them. Therefore, when the man asked us for cash, I said, Sorry, sir. I'm afraid we don't have any spare change on us. I was so naive, it made me sick. As to why I feel this way is because of what I now realize. We were told we lived in a safe area with low crime or theft, were all 13-year-old girls still carrying our spending money and had no idea how to handle the situation. The man began to step closer to us and outstretched one of his hands, which was covered in soiled bandages and covered in dirt. However, Ella is easily angered and is not afraid to fight people. So she immediately stepped forward and said a strong and affirmative, back off. Out of the corner of my eye, I could see my two other friends, Raven and Jess, became rigid with fear when Ella said this. The man began to get angry with us and said, well, it's probably because you spent all of your money on useless shit like junk food and treats. You ever think about those of us who can't afford those types of things, huh? No, and you know why? Because you're all spoiled shits. His voice was thick and raspy, but sounded weak, and his speech was slurred, and his posture was extremely laxed. His vibe was completely off-putting. He sent chills down my spine and made me nauseous. Just then, Jess nudged me in my back and looked at me and mouthed the words, Do something! And I am the type of person who doesn't get angry unless provoked, and I never let people scare those I care about. I reluctantly stepped forward and told the man to back off or there was going to be a problem. He looked at me dead in the eyes, and I will never forget what he did. He breathed in deeply, long and slow. His eyes rolled in the back of his head, and without saying a word or opening his eyes, turned around and walked around to, what I can assume, the back of the Safeway. The strangest part of all of this were the other people entering the Safeway. 
None of them seemed to notice the man at all, not a single one. One person in particular, the man was about to run into them, yet they hadn't made any form of notice of his presence. The four of us were all still in shock, but I spoke up and said, we need to go now. I regret my decision that day more than anything in my life. We should have gone back into the store and gotten Ella's friend's help, but instead we isolated ourselves and went straight to the only place where we would be alone. My friends and I then began running, and I mean running, back to Ella's house. I was at the back of the group due to my injury, and I swear on my life that I could hear footsteps behind me in the scrub oak we were running alongside. I wanted to look back, but I just kept on running. My conscience made me feel like I was running from pure evil. The sun had gone down at this point, and Ella was the only one who knew the way back but it was so dark that none of us could see where we were. Not that there was anything to see except for woods and the occasional weathered street sign. We stopped running after what seemed like 20 minutes and we were all exhausted. I knew the others were scared and acting frantically in their flight response. First to speak up and said, Ella, do you recognize anything around us? She sounded like she was on the verge of tears when she said, no. I'm so sorry, guys. I have no idea how to get home. Jess started to cry softly, and Raven went silent and sat down in the dirt. Something in the pit of my stomach urged me to speak up and tell my friends that I thought I heard those man's footsteps behind me as we were running. But I ignored it. They were all freaking out as it was, and I didn't want to escalate the situation any further. I knew basic survival skills for different occasions, so I took inventory of our surroundings. The moon was rising to my left, which meant the mountains were to the right. I looked on the mountain and found the lights of the radio towers glowing at the top of one of the higher peaks. Knowing this, I knew that Ella's house had to be about 4 or 5 o'clock. I shared this with my friends and started to lead them in that direction. I thought I saw a wave of relief on their faces, but I wasn't sure at that time. Just as we began walking in that direction, we all heard what sounded like a dying animal wailing in the scrub oak behind us. Branches cracking, dry grass shifting, and some small critters scurrying for cover. The smell of death, and what I can only explain as alcohol, filled the air. We all froze. I motioned them to start moving to the other side of the path and hide in the shadows. Luckily, we were on a paved path, so we were able to move quietly, and we were all wearing dark clothing that made no sound when we moved. Raven said we needed to get downwind in case it was a predator, but in my gut, I recognized that smell. The moments after that were silent. We heard nothing. The smell went away, and all of us were so quiet it was like we never existed. I was about to motion to the girls that we should start moving, but Jess grabbed my arm. She said nothing, but the look on her face told me. We weren't alone. She motioned with her eyes to look to my left, over my shoulder. I wanted to vomit. There was a dead deer being dragged along the road. I could see in the moonlight its blood was painting the pavement in a dark, thick color. I couldn't see what was dragging the deer but I could now hear faint, raspy breathing in synchronistic waves the deer was being pulled in. I slowly turned my head back to my friends, who were all on my right side. Raven's hand was being held tightly over her mouth, her eyes closed and curled up in a ball, trying not to make any noise from her faint whimpering. Ella had a cold expression that made me realize she was disassociating and could no longer take in anything that was happening around us. Knowing this, I grabbed them all by their hands, looked them in the eyes with reassuring glances, and told them as quietly as I could, we are going to be okay. Don't worry. We know how to get home now, and it's already killed. So as long as we don't go near its prey, it will leave us alone. We just need to move as quietly and swiftly as possible. They began to come back to reality and nod their heads in approval. I lied in some of my statements, trying to convince myself that they were true. I continued, You three will go ahead of me. Raven, 
you need to take the lead with Ella and keep her grounded. Raven was the type who needed something to distract herself, but also to keep Ella in check since she was the best at keeping people calm and grounded. She had enough experience with Ella and I since we both have mental illnesses that require grounding sometimes. She will be able to recognize where we are sooner or later. And when that happens, you need to relay that information to me through Jess. Jess, you go ahead of me and make sure that we stay as close together as possible. With that, we began to move as quietly as we could, yet still holding our bags since we hadn't realized we were still holding them. After about six minutes of pure fear, walking in the darkness at the back of the group, Jess relayed to me that Ella knew where we were and that she thought we would be home in about five minutes of walking. Just then, as Jess was picking up her pace to keep in the middle, I heard it again. I could hear the deep and long breaths that sounded exactly like those of the man at the store behind me. I am aware that paranoia can do unimaginable things, but this was no paranoia. I picked up my pace to where we were all together, knowing that we were more powerful together. We finally reached Ella's neighborhood and sprinted to her house. There were other house lights on so we could finally see what was around us. My subconscious told me to look behind us to see if I could see what was behind me now that there was light. As I ran, I looked back behind me and my heart stopped. I saw the silhouette of a man in the scrub oak with their hands outstretched and head arched back. It looked like they were almost worshiping something or someone. I whipped my head back around and sprinted at full speed, gathering my friends in front of me, urging them to run faster, saying a simple, go. We reached Ella's front door, punched in the door key and slammed the door shut. We were all panting in her doorway, but they were completely unaware of what I saw. We gathered up in the basement, since it was the most guarded area of the house with an alarm on the basement door if it was opened. Ella pulled out the air mattresses her family kept in the closet, and we gathered enough blankets to cover every square inch of the room. Once we all began to feel safe again, they all thanked me for keeping them calm and getting them back here safely. I said nothing, finally processing what I saw and everything we experienced. They nervously asked if I was all right, and with tears in my eyes, I told them what I saw and heard. They all said that they believed me, but I don't think that they will ever truly understand what I felt and saw that night when I saw that man, and I am so thankful for that. But the story doesn't end here. Now, I am a very heavy sleeper. For context, my mother used to wake me up with banging pots outside my door, and even that failed to work sometimes, so I have no idea why this happened. For more context, since we were in the basement, the windows were built underground with enough space for someone to fit in the space in front of it. Now, I still don't know if it was a dream or not, but I woke up to the sound of more breathing that same night, and when I opened my eyes, in the reflection of the mirror in Ella's bathroom, I could see outside of her window. My eyes tried to focus on the silhouette of what I saw, but I didn't have my glasses on. But from what I could make out, there was a person with their palms pressed on the glass of the window, staring at us while we slept. I passed out from the collected fear of that night finally hitting me, and when I woke up, there was nothing there, not even a handprint. I asked them if they woke up at all last night, and they all said no. It is now years later, and let it be known that I have not had a single dream since that night but I still have night terrors of open windows filled with figures watching me sleep, the smell of death and alcohol, darkness surrounding me completely, and running in place with death closing in on me until I wake up in cold sweats, trembling until morning. I don't know if these nightmares will ever stop, but I am thankful that none of my friends experience the same horrors I do. My name is Kai, and this incident happened in England when I was about 10 years old. It shocked everybody, as the crime rate where this happened was slim to none. Anyways, let's get into the story. 
It was a snowy December day, about one or two days until the Christmas break, so everybody was getting hyper. We didn't really do any work, so me and my five friends were talking and whatnot. But then my teacher, Mrs. J, got a text from the principal that a maniac entered the school with a machete, hoping to get some kills. Even though we really didn't do lockdown drills, we were smarter than your run-of-the-mill year sixes, so we quickly turned off the lights, closed the windows, and locked the doors, and armed ourselves with sharp pencils. And I mean very sharp pencils. We were all sitting in the dark waiting for the lockdown to end. But unluckily for us, it didn't. Around ten minutes into the lockdown, we heard the screams of a woman, a loud stomping near the stairs, and she was singing, Die, die, die. I'll stab you till you die. Die, die, die. I hope you don't survive. At this point, at least half of the class was crying, and the rest of us were barely keeping it together. At around 15 minutes into the lockdown, the mentally unstable woman stomped up the stairs. This was bad news as we were the closest upstair classroom to the stairs. And at this point, Mrs. J passed out. So we were fucked. As we were the closest upstairs classroom to the stairs, the woman tried to smash the door's window so she could attempt to kill the 23 kids. The other seven were absent without an adult to protect them. To our horror, she succeeded, and she managed to unlock the door from the outside, and she was now in the room. And she had the most widest and creepiest smile on the planet. Of course, thanks to my luck, she struck me, cutting open my leg. Thanks to the amount of blood pouring out from the side of my leg, I was on the brink of passing out. And I should count my lucky stars that my friends had the guts to fight her. And I might say they managed to knock her out and restrain her. The police arrived and arrested her. And I was transported to the hospital. And I had the worst Christmas break of my life. Turns out the woman had stabbed some of my classmates too. And they were sent to the hospital. Luckily we all survived. The woman was sentenced to 30 years in prison. The biggest twist of all was that Mrs. J was friends with the woman, and she helped her so she could kill us. That explains why Mrs. J passed out and why our class was targeted. Mrs. J was sentenced to 15 years in prison. My name is Sophia. I live in Texas in a small town called Groom. Now, personally, this story isn't one of my own, but my cousin from Oklahoma. His name is Alex. And as he doesn't like talking about this situation, I decided to present the issue. At my school, we were given a week off. And, well, my family decided to take advantage of this and invite some family members over to spend the week. They agreed and came over, coming along later more so in the evening. When me and Alex saw each other, he suggested we some games or chat to keep us entertained. So I took up my Nintendo Switch and we played some Mario Kart for a round and an hour and a half or so. At some time later, my parents and my cousin's parents told us they were headed out to my grandparents' house for a drink. Me and my cousin nodded and continued our game while my sister stayed on the couch and my oldest cousin Abel was chatting with his friends through his phone. The time being was fine. Me and my cousin continued playing different games at times but each and every few minutes, his phone would go off with either a call or a message. At some point, I asked him about it. He responded with a nervous laugh and said, Oh, it's nothing. My friend has just been a bit pissed off with me. Let's just continue playing. I was insistent on him telling me, but he always just rejected me. Soon enough, I gave up and just started playing more games with him. We got bored and ended up watching a movie with some leftover pizza that we had in our fridge and some fruit punch. Then Alex told me he had to head to the bathroom and that he would be back. Once he left though, his phone went off again. I know I shouldn't have gone through his phone, but I was curious. So I checked his notifications and there was a text message from someone named Johnny. I've heard about John before. He's Alex's closest friend, so I guess it wouldn't hurt to check what he wrote. I opened the message and saw about 15 unread messages, almost all of them being either in caps or just slurs and bad words. 
One that caught my eye was one that read, You bitch, I know where you are. Don't ignore me. I'll fucking kill you and that bitch. I was confused. Who was he talking about? Then John wrote another message. I'm outside the house. You better get out here now or I'll force myself in. I dropped the phone. A shiver ran up my spine. Then I heard footsteps behind me and saw Alex. He asked what was wrong, but before I could answer, we heard the sound of glass shattering. And me and my cousin gasped and ran into the room where my sister was in with our older cousin shortly behind us. What the hell was that? Abel said. At this point, my sister was in tears while I could feel my vision began to blur. I kept my composure and remained still. We all hid down in my sister's desk while my older cousin remained alongside the door, locking it and pulling his phone out to call the cops and then our parents. I held my breath and began to cry quietly, and I could feel my hands begin to quiver. I looked over at Alex's phone. It was booming with messages from Johnny, and I could tell Alex was terrified. Then we heard the door banging, and that's when my sister screamed and wailed our crying. Alex, I know you're in there, you shit. Let me in. It was Johnny. I could tell from his deep voice, and I suppose that Alex did too. Then we heard the cry of sirens and then a sudden flood of footsteps. Bangs, yelling, shouts, and a gunshot. Abel unlocked the door, and what we saw horrified us. We saw Johnny on the floor with a police officer above him, pushing down, unable to let him get up. Johnny was covered in various scratch marks and bruises and soon looked up at us and gave an angry expression. You bitch! Alex, I swear I'll kill you. And that's the last of what we heard from him. But what I do know was that he had managed to break into our house by breaking the back window located in our kitchen. He had a pistol in his hand and was planning to shoot my cousin. When he was charged and sentenced, I asked my cousin why Johnny had wanted to do such a thing since they have been really close friends. Apparently, Alex said that Johnny had started to get involved with a series of drugs and had wanted him to join. But when he refused, he and his other friend Carlos reported him for drug abuse and since he was underage. And when he was taken, he had visited him in juvenile prison that Johnny had threatened him. I was terrified, but that's when I asked him. Wait, how did he get out early from prison? Alex just looked at me and shook his head. Right now, Alex has been visiting his therapist and getting prepared for graduation, while I am just entering high school. Honestly, I didn't think I've experienced a more horrid situation in my life. My name is Ani Rood. Right now I'm 18, but this happened to me when I was 9 years old. I used to live in the United States in the state of Texas. It was a Saturday in January of the year 2011. In another three days, my birthday was coming up, so I was happy and I had done all my work with excitement. From the age of six, I had a habit of playing with my toys in my backyard in the evening around 6 p.m. So that Saturday, I was so overjoyed because my birthday was coming up that I played until 9 p.m. I went in because my parents called me as it was pretty late and always asked me to close the back door after I entered the house. But that day, I had forgotten to close the back door, and even my parents forgot to remind me to close the door. I finished dinner around 9.30 p.m. and watched a TV show with my parents till 10. After the show was finished, they told me to sleep as I had crossed my usual bedtime, which was at 9 p.m. But that day, my parents allowed me to sleep a little late as it was a Saturday. I brushed my teeth and my mom kissed me goodnight, and I passed out. Around 1 a.m. I urgently needed to go to the bathroom, and so I jumped out of my bed, walked to my room door, which was closed. And every day I keep the door open, but it was closed, which is a bit odd. I didn't think much of it, and I thought my mom closed the door by accident, so I tried to pull the door, but it didn't open. I thought it was locked from the inside, but when I checked, it was locked from the outside. I wanted to call my parents, but my parents' bedroom was in the top right corner of my house, and my room was in the bottom left corner. We had two floors, and my parents lived on the second floor, and I lived on the first. 
but I needed to use the bathroom so urgently that I decided to jump out of my window. And my window is about three feet away from the grassy ground, so I jumped, and as I expected, I had landed safely on the ground. Then I headed to the front door and rang the bell. I didn't expect my parents to open the door after I rang the bell once, so I rang the doorbell several times. On my fifth attempt, my dad finally opened the door with a baseball bat and was astonished to see me ringing the bell and was wondering why did I go out of the house. I first had to finish something, so I rushed to the bathroom and when I came out, I explained everything to my dad. Well, he didn't believe me, so I asked him to check. We both went in the direction of my room and when he checked it, it was indeed locked from the outside. We both rushed to my parents' bedroom and woke my mom to check whether she locked the door, but she told us she didn't. Well, my dad explained everything to her and she was shocked. She immediately hugged me. After this, we heard a loud thump in the living room downstairs. We all jumped and became even more terrified. My dad grabbed the same baseball bat and walked downstairs. I and my mom were scared to be all alone, so we followed my dad downstairs. My dad had already found out what caused that thump and said it was a book which he was reading. He kept almost on the edge of the table in the living room, but he kept it in such a way that it still wouldn't fall. So I was pretty convinced that there was someone else in our house. So I told my thought to my dad, but he still didn't listen. Then we all heard a scratching noise coming from our living room closet. We were all terrified at that moment. But my dad had the balls to go to the closet, not forgetting the baseball bat. My mom was ready to dial 911, but dad told her not to call them yet. The moment my dad opened the door is the moment that will bring chills down my spine to this day. When he opened the closet door, an ugly man was standing with greasy hair and wrinkly skin. It seemed that he didn't have any teeth either. But when I saw what he was carrying in his hands, I screamed and told my dad. He was carrying a long kitchen knife. He then started running towards my dad and tried to stab him. But my dad reacted quickly and smashed his face with the baseball bat. My mom had already called the cops. And then it hit me that this was the man who locked me in my room. But how did he get in? Then I remembered that I had forgotten to close the back door after I came in. That's how he must have entered the house. The cops arrived in five minutes, but still the man was blacked out. Two officers pulled the car in front of our house and handcuffed the man and arrested him. He was still unconscious. I and my family were relieved and I did hug my parents after the officers left the house. After that, I always remembered to lock the back door after I entered the house. When I became 12, I completely quit playing with toys. But I still wonder what would have happened to me if my dad hadn't reacted quickly and smashed the bat on that man's face. I guess that would have been the end of my family. But I'm glad that didn't happen. My name is Ellie. This happened when I was 21. It was on the 19th of May, 2020, when I went to the hospital because I had sprained my ankle lately. Nothing out of the ordinary happened until a man sat next to me. He looked like he was in his 40s, his hair and beard were messy, and looked like he hadn't showered in days, or maybe weeks. He was on his phone. I was a bit nosy, and I'm glad I was because what he was doing on his phone was texting a person named Dave. He texted Dave and told him, there's a girl sitting next to me. And Dave replied, you know what to do. It had me shooked. He texted again to Dave, meet me in the car now. He stood up and exited the hospital in a hurry. Luckily, after maybe one minute, a nurse came to me and said, Elizabeth James. And I stood up and walked inside the room, and I explained everything that had happened. And the nurse called the police, and the man was captured by the police in a blue rusty van with another person, which seemed to be Dave. 
The police found out that he had a gun with a pocket knife in his pockets. And after three days, the news reported that the man had escaped from Mexico prison two years ago and teamed up with an infamous robberer and kidnapper. I had the feeling that something bad was going to happen this year, that someone would die. I went to sleep and I started dreaming about someone having a heart attack. My brother was staying with his girlfriend and came home. He said to me that he felt like he was about to get a heart attack. I told him about my dream. It was scary because I've predicted the future before, but then small things, like someone who would say that I was cute with some random guy, and then it would happen in real life. Only in real life, the things that are said to someone in my dreams are always said to another, so I could never know what would happen to whom. I wanted to put on my Snapchat story, if someone has a heart attack, I am a predictor. But I didn't, because I didn't want people to think I am crazy. I woke up the next day, and I was in shock with what I heard. Your friend's aunt died this night because of a heart attack. To this day, I don't know if it's a coincidence, but I am so confused. This happened to me when I was 10 years old. I was going to my aunt's house. On my way, I came across a park and I saw a girl sitting on a swing staring at me. I ignored it. After I reached, me and my aunt went to the elevator because my aunt lived in an apartment which was on the top floor. We took the elevator. Suddenly, the lights went off. We were standing still when I saw the same girl flashing and coming closer to me. I got scared, but I ignored it, thinking I was just hallucinating. A few hours later, it was around midnight. I was on my phone and everyone was sleeping, so I decided to go to sleep. But just then, I heard a voice. The voice was of a girl saying, follow me, Taylor. It scared me, but I decided to follow it. I couldn't see anything, but only hear her voice. After some time, the voice stopped and said, one more step. As I was about to take one step forward, someone pulled me. When I woke up, I saw that I was lying on the floor very close to the balcony railing and my head was bleeding as I had fallen directly on my head. And then I rushed back to my aunt, woke her up, and told her everything. She didn't believe anything I said and sent me home. After that, I returned home and started reading the news and I saw something very horrifying. I saw a girl who was very similar to the girl in the swing, and that's when I remembered that I had gone to the park just a few days ago with my friends to play, and there were people gathered around, and they had told us to go home because there had been an accident near the swing. After reading deeper, I found that the kids who had gone to the park had also heard the same voice, and some of them had even died. After that day, I couldn't stop thinking about what would have happened if someone hadn't pulled me. This happened about three years ago. Me and my family had moved into a new house. It was an older house compared to the others on the street we lived on. One day, me and my sister were playing in her room when she suddenly asked me, have you seen the little girl that watches you when you sleep? I got chills and asked her what she meant. She said to me, there is a girl that stays under my bed. We talk a lot, and one day she told me that you interest her and that she has been keeping an eye on you while you sleep. I told her that she was too old to be telling stories and that she shouldn't scare me like that. One night, I woke up suddenly. I didn't know why I had woken up. I assumed it was a noise and tried to go back to sleep. A few minutes later, I heard whispering in my ear. It sounded like a little girl. She whispered to me, It offends me that you don't think I'm real. In fact, you've made me quite mad. I almost pissed myself. I was so scared that I couldn't move. I suddenly felt hands around my throat and I couldn't breathe. I screamed and my parents came running into my room. They asked me what was wrong and I told them that a girl had tried to choke me. I thought they wouldn't believe me, but apparently she had been paying them visits in the middle of the night too. 
We moved out of that house pretty quickly. Even though it's been a while, my sister still brings up that girl sometimes in our conversations. My name is Serena, and this happened on December 1st, 2018. Me and my dad were going to the father-daughter dance at my school, but on our way there, we needed gas. So we stopped at a gas station, and while waiting in the car, I heard a knock on the window. I quickly looked over and saw a terrifying woman who was covered, and I mean covered, in blood. She was smiling ear to ear. At that moment, my dad came back to the car and the woman walked away. My dad asked me what just happened and I told him everything. He looked terrified and soon after, we drove away. We had a fun time at the dance, but what really scares me is that on December 1st, 2019, my dad passed away after going to that same gas station. They found him in the trash can out back, covered in blood, but what is really scary is he died from an overdose. Why was he covered in blood then? This might not scare you, but it still sends a shiver down my spine. I was 18 when this happened. A friend invited us over to hang out with him at his place because he didn't want to be alone in his old house. He even promised to treat us with some snacks and drinks to bribe us to come over. It was an offer that was hard to refuse. Most of his family lives in the city because of work, and whenever they are free, they try to check up on their old house. It was an ancestral home. The doors were antique looking with flowery details that gave it an older vibe. The front door is next to the living room, and there is a room along the corridor. In front of the living room is the kitchen, which is connected to the bathroom. We chatted and poured some drinks, and everyone was having a good time. I need to tell you that I have a low tolerance when it comes to alcohol. Either I easily get dizzy or my skin becomes reddish, and sometimes both. After a few shots, I told someone that I needed to use the restroom. It was a pretty large bathroom, but not a faucet was in sight. I figured the two basins served a purpose. After doing my thing, I tried to reach for the soap dispenser to wash my hands. What happened next still horrifies me to this day. An amputated hand reached from inside the drain in the sink and tried grabbing my arm. It scared the hell out of me. Though I was scared, I tried to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me, because at that point I was pretty tipsy. Still, I was getting goosebumps all over my body. Suddenly, my instincts told me that I needed to get out of there. No, I knew that I had to get out of there, and as I tried to leave, my sight landed on something strange. A faceless lady wearing a white gown was standing in front of me with long black hair and soaking wet clothes. Standing face to face with this thing for a few seconds felt like an eternity, not to mention that she was blocking my only way out. I wanted to get out of the restroom so bad, but I was so fucking frightened that I was petrified and couldn't move. I finally gathered all my courage and fled without washing my hands and accidentally slammed the door. As I approached my friends, I tried to act normal. I wanted to tell them what I saw, but I doubt they would have believed me. Knowing them, they would have accused me of hallucinating or trying to make up stories. Someone looked at me and asked, where have you been? I went to the toilet, I answered. What he said next shook me to my core. Try not to roam around. A lady and a hand randomly greets visitors here. After that encounter, for months, I was uneasy whenever I went to an unfamiliar bathroom. One time I had just got home from school. It was a long day, and I could not wait to get home and get some rest. About 30 minutes later, I was in a deep sleep. And the next thing I knew, I was in one of my old houses when I was little, about five years old and I was just waking up and getting ready for school. Then, when I was driving with my mom to school, I saw a big strange shadow around a shady tree. It was like a demon from hell and looked skinny and tall and had blood dripping from its mouth. I told my mom what I saw, but for some reason she couldn't hear me. I was thinking, should I keep it to myself or should I tell someone at school? It was about lunchtime and I went to the cafeteria but I was at the back of the line since I had to finish some schoolwork that everyone else had already finished. 
I was getting ready to be served my lunch, and I could see behind the lady who was serving me the exact same figure that I saw, but this time it didn't have a head, and I wasn't aware of what the lunch lady had put on my tray. It was the head of the figure, staring at me with its tongue out, dripping blood again. I threw the tray and ran so fast out of the cafeteria and out of the school, but the school called my parents for leaving school grounds without permission. I tried to tell my mom and dad everything that was going on today, but they didn't believe me. They thought I was just overreacting since I was only five years old and had that type of imagination. But when we got home, my mom said I was grounded for a week and I had to do twice as many chores. It was then around bedtime and I went to sleep forgetting everything that had happened today. I was woken up by a tug on my back and it was my mom saying, son, was this the thing that you saw earlier today at school? And she pointed out the window and I was in complete shock. I saw the shadow outside and it was looking for me. So my dad got his gun for protection. But then I went to look outside again and the figure was gone. And at that same exact moment, it appeared in my room and it was roaring so loud, it woke me out of my deep sleep and I fell off my bed. I decided to keep it to myself, but after a week I saw my sister drawing. I asked her, what are you drawing, sis? She showed me, and I got goosebumps all over my body. It was the same figure that was in my dream, and I was speechless. I told her I would give her five bucks if I could keep the drawing. She agreed and then fell asleep. I had to take out the trash, so I secretly grabbed my dad's lighter and took that drawing, and did what I had to do. I watched the paper burn for several minutes and then went back to sleep. And to this day, that picture still gives me goosebumps just thinking about it. I'm from the Philippines. When I was a kid, my grandmother was the only one who took care of me because mom and dad were always working. Memories with my grandma are a blur but the only clear memory I have with her is of her laying in her deathbed. She kept saying my name and she said, Come here, don't be scared. I can see her body shaking. I don't recall what my feelings were, but I know for a fact mom was crying her eyes out. This happened around 2006-2007. I was grandma's favorite. I saw baby pictures of me and she was always carrying me. When my birthday came around, she always showered me with gifts. Yeah, I can't remember much, but I'm one lucky grandson. I wish I had clear memories of her, though. Well, anyway, I was five years old when she died. Three years passed, and then I was eight. Filipinos are very religious people, so, yeah, they believe in superstitions and ghosts. I sure believed when I was a kid, too. In those three years, there were some occasions where mom would start smiling and would tell me that she felt grandma's presence. When mom felt that I was getting scared, she would look at me and say, Don't you miss her? As a kid, that scared me shitless. My ninth birthday was coming up on November 1st. In the Philippines, that's the Day of the Dead. Coincidence, am I right? So mom and dad cooked some food bought a cake and gave me a gift. I don't really recall the gift, but it was a toy. Mom suddenly went silent. She said, remember when grandma used to give you toys? Can't really blame her. She must have missed her so much. Fast forward and I remember mom tucking me in bed and turning off the lights. I remember slowly falling asleep and waking up. I heard someone singing happy birthday so I slowly opened my eyes to the point where I was squinting. I saw someone who was dressed in white and was old. Then I realized she looked like my grandma. Take note, I was squinting, and when she died, I was five years old, so that's why I wasn't really sure. She was singing happy birthday, and she slowly came up to my ear and whispered, Come here, don't be scared. I couldn't take it anymore, so I screamed as loud as I could, waking up my mom and my dad. I told my mom and dad what happened, and what mom said still gives me the chills to this day. 
I felt it too, and that is not your grandma. Grandma always protected you during your birthday. You have the birthday of death. Spirits, especially evil spirits, are attracted to you, and they can easily dwell in your body if you let them. I don't know if that's a superstition, but it's better to be safe than sorry. I'm a 32-year-old man now, but this event scared me for life. When I was 14, me and my mom went on a holiday to see some of our family in Canada, and we were very excited. Our family was quite distant at the time, as my father had left us for a model in France and we'd moved to England for a fresh start. Well, anyway, we got there and I was reminded just how beautiful it is where my grandma and grandfather live. By the way, this was around winter time, so it was quite cold. We were enjoying our roast until I heard an echoing scream outside the cabin. Me being the person I am, I just laughed and shrugged it off. I was actually petrified of whatever thing would make a noise like that at night. So my grandfather said to me, now let's go get some layers on and go check what it is. Being very large for my age, around 6 feet 1 and about 95 kilograms, or around 200 pounds or so, I was a very scary looking person to stand up to or try to fight, so I had to say yes. We got our coats and my grandfather brought his gun just for safety. We headed out around 50 meters from the cabin when we saw what it was. It was a moose. It had been crushed by a rock and was making the same scream as before, so we had to put it out of its misery. We needed to call someone to help us get rid of the corpse, but we were too tired and it had started to snow. But something was off. There was nowhere for a rock that size to have come from. We headed back to the cabin. I was just laughing to myself, thinking that my anxious feeling tonight was because I was just being childish. But then, all that changed later that night. About 20 minutes later, we heard the same scream. We all jumped, and I looked outside. The body wasn't there anymore, and I shat a brick. I was confused as to how a giant moose corpse pinned to the ground with a rock that weighed probably twice as much as me could have just disappeared. Then I saw something I still have nightmares about. It could have been a coincidence, but a man with a Glock G45 was staring at us, and he aimed right at me. Then he shouted, Anyone fucking move? This big fuck dies! What he didn't know was that I also carried a penknife on me because of an incident I had when I was younger. While he was paying attention to the rest of my family, I jabbed it right into his hand that was holding the gun. He dropped it and I ran right at him, tackling him to the ground, so my family had time to call the police. We traded punch for punch and because I couldn't hold him down, he kept trying to reach his gun after every one of his punches. But the scariest thing I remember was that he was just smiling. I ended up trying to stomp on his hand so he would forget about the gun. Then bang! I'd been shot, straight in and out of my shoulder. Luckily, I had adrenaline rushing through my body and stomped on his hand, breaking it in multiple different places. Then I stomped on his ribs and started kicking his head until he was knocked out. The police ended up coming around 10 minutes later, and I was rushed to the hospital with a few missing teeth and a broken jaw. The maniac had several injuries. Three broken ribs, all five fingers crushed, a broken jaw, a broken nose, and a concussion. It turned out that this man had broken out of prison a few weeks prior. I don't ever sleep at night anymore. Now I'm known as an owl, and I sleep throughout the day. I think to myself now that if I didn't have that penknife from my father, I would be dead, and my mom, grandma, and grandfather would be as well. Just know that every person around you has your trust and respect, and you have theirs because not everybody in this world is a nice person. It happened almost two years ago. Due to working overtime, it was almost 1 a.m. when I finally left work. 
And by the way, I live in the Philippines, and at that time of night, there were very few people waiting to ride home. The only available public vehicles were jeepneys and UV Express. UV Express is like a carpool, and I always ride on that since there's no direct route of jeepneys to my house. There was this one UV Express that stopped by our area, and there were only a few passengers inside. There was a man at the back, one woman in the middle, and another man beside the driver. I sat beside the woman in the middle. Regularly, it would only take around 30 minutes before I reached my stop. After about 15 minutes, the man beside the driver and the woman beside me exited at the same time. I was left with the man behind me, who had short black hair and was wearing a plain t-shirt and jeans. The driver told me that he would not be taking any more passengers since it was already late and his home was also by my stop, so he removed the route sign on the windshield. I was browsing my mobile phone when suddenly the guy behind my back asked the driver to stop. At first, I didn't pay any attention to him because the driver should have heard him clearly, but he continued to drive as if he hadn't heard anyone. The guy calmly asked the driver to stop again, saying he was way past his stop. I was pretty annoyed at the driver because he seemed to just ignore the guy. So I told the driver that the guy was asking him to stop while still looking at my phone. Then I noticed that the driver gave me a confused look, and what he told me gave me goosebumps. He told me in a serious and confused voice that I was the only passenger left in the van, and that's why he said that he would not take any more passengers. I looked slowly behind me, and the man was still there. The driver stepped on the gasoline and drove as fast as he could. After a few minutes, we reached the mall near my home and the guy in the back was gone. The driver told me that some of his fellow drivers have also experienced the same thing, that an unknown guy would ask the driver to stop at a nearby abandoned house. I still ride on UV Express, but I avoid riding after midnight as much as possible. I was 11 at that time. We were living in a pretty big house. There was one empty room. The walls were old and there was no window. My parents never used that room, so I always considered it my second room. I decorated it with an antique rug my mom had, a few lamps and some pillows. I used to go in that room when I was angry at my parents. I sometimes heard some strange sounds like scratching, but I figured that it was just a mouse so I just ignored it. One day my parents were screaming at me because I got into a fight at school. I locked myself in the room. I was crying but I somehow fell asleep in that room and woke up sometime in the middle of the night. I started hearing some strange sounds coming from my window. Tapping sounds. Tap, tap, tap. I turned and looked but saw nothing. So I laid back down on the rug but then I heard something on my door. It was the same sound that was coming from the window. Tap, tap, tap. I slowly looked over. There was a woman standing there with light gray hair and a long white dress. She startled me and I asked her why she kept tapping on my door. When I said that, I knew I shouldn't have, but it was too late. She turned her face to me. Her mouth was so big and her eyes were so small. She came over to me and whispered in my ear, I'm waiting for you to wake up. I couldn't scream or call my parents. It felt like something was holding my mouth shut. Then she told me, next time it will be even better. Then I woke up and it was morning. I was so frightened by what she said. What did she mean? When I went downstairs, I saw on my door some little scratches that I know weren't there before. I told my parents what happened, but they didn't believe me. I never slept in that room again. I think that the thing she told me, I'm waiting for you to wake up, had a deeper meaning than just waking up from a dream. This happened when I was 14. I was sleeping, and suddenly I felt the urge to wake up. When I tried to sit up, I couldn't. I thought I was dead, until I realized my body didn't know I was awake and I was paralyzed. I tried to remain calm as I collected my thoughts and tried to figure out a solution of why I couldn't move. 
But then suddenly, I saw out of the corner of my eye something in the corner of my room. As I slowly turned my gaze to the darkest corner of the room, I saw what appeared to be a cloaked woman with an abnormally large head and sharp teeth staring back at me. Every time I blinked, she seemed to be getting closer to my bed. I tried hard not to close my eyes, but it was difficult. The woman was at the end of my bed and began crawling towards me. I remembered my mother told me a prayer to say, Now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. I kept saying it until I fell asleep. When I woke up again, it was morning, and I was finally able to move again. After a sigh of relief, I looked back in the corner where the lady was standing, and what I saw will forever be engraved in my memory. In the corner of my room were the words, I'll get you next time, written in blood. When I turned 18, my parents literally kicked me out of the house. I come from Nigeria, Africa, but I was born in the U.S. My parents did give me enough money to rent a small house, so I worked at a restaurant, but I also wanted to make some extra money on the side. So I used eBay. I don't know if you're familiar with that app, but you can sell stuff you don't need anymore. I had some stuff I wore when I was about 13 or 14, so I posted them to sell on eBay. Shortly after, someone contacted me and said they wanted to buy my items. We talked about the price, but he also didn't have a profile, so I didn't really know the gender of the person. I just assumed it was a girl or a parent who wanted to buy something for their teenage kid, but I didn't really think much of it. This person wanted to come over on Saturday at 7 p.m. My friend also was coming over around the same time, so it didn't bother me since this person was just going to take the clothes and leave. On Saturday around 6.45, I heard a knock at the door. I opened the door to see a six foot five man standing with blonde hair and blue eyes, well built and casually dressed. We stared at each other for about 10 seconds and then he asked, um, are you the girl selling the clothes? I nodded yes and let him in. Are you home alone? He asked. Uh, no, my dad is upstairs, I answered, but it was a lie. I was not going to tell a stranger that I was home alone. I mean, that's stupid. He asked other weird questions, like when I was going to be home alone, or if my dad was a deep sleeper. I answered mostly with lies. I got the clothes out quick, just to get rid of him and his questions. I gave him the clothes. He told me that the clothes were nice and nodded with agreement. He told me he would give me $300 more than the actual amount. I was pleased, and when he asked if he could use the bathroom, I said yes, because I didn't want to seem rude. But 10 minutes passed and he was still in the bathroom, so I went upstairs to check on him and asked why he was in there so long. On the way, my bedroom door burst open and someone began choking me. I tried to fight back, but it was useless. Slowly, everything blacked out. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed, and there was my friend and my parents. I asked them what happened, and my friend started to explain that when she saw a guy carrying me to a car, she became confused, so she called me. When I didn't pick up, she took a picture of the car just in case. So when the car left, she went around to my house and saw my phone ringing on the couch. That gave her chills because she knew I didn't go anywhere without my phone, not even to my neighbor's house so she instantly called the police. When they arrived, they saw that a car was parked in front of a house. When they went inside, they saw the eBay dude and five other men touching me in a way they shouldn't while I was still blacked out. After that, they brought me to the hospital. And then the police came in and told me something terrifying. Yes, these men are in jail now, but in the house that they lived in, They found pictures of me doing different activities. And in a drawer of a closet, they found pictures of different black women. When the officers asked where these women were, they said that they were already dead. I'm just so glad I didn't decide to cancel my outing with my friend, or else I would have ended up just like these women. My name is Bense. I'm from Debrecen, a fairly large city in Hungary. I used to play basketball with two of my friends in a team. 
One was my best friend, the other one was from our team. One night, after practice, they had to get home early. I don't live far away from the school, where the gym was, so I had time. I escorted my friends to the bus terminal. When we were going there, there wasn't a lot of people. An old lady, a younger woman with a black leather jacket, and a middle-aged man. My friend offered us a cigarette, so we waited for the bus. Time went by and the bus finally came. Line 42A to IT services via Canese Medical Center. I waved hello and started to go home. When I left the bus stop, I realized that the woman in the jacket was following me. She caught up to me and greeted me. I didn't see clearly what she looked like. She had black bangs and was fairly tall. Her voice was really deep, but it was still a woman's voice. You didn't even inhale the cigarette properly, she said. I actually did. Sometimes I enjoy it, but I'm not an addict, I replied. She was laughing a little, but I didn't hear it properly. My brother used to smoke. He didn't grow much taller than you, she said. Mmm, okay. All right, just be safe, Bensie. Okay, bye. Then I turned right to the sidewalk when I realized I never told her my name. I immediately turned back, but she wasn't there. There weren't any alleys, other streets, bus stops. I don't know who she was or what was her name, but she vanished into thin air. She didn't get on any bus. She was just waiting there for me. My name is Leonie Toussaint. I live in a small town in France called saint veron I'm quite paranoid after this event occurred in my life. It takes a lot of courage for me to write this. After all, it was quite eerie, but you can be the judge of that. Where I live, it is a mountainous area, so a lot of tourists visit to see the wonderful sights. One day, my friends and I decided to go hiking up in the mountains, which is only a couple of miles from my house. As we were making our way up the mountain, one of my friends suddenly slipped and sprained her ankle. In a distance, we saw a figure approaching us. Naturally, we shouted towards him and begged him for help. As he made his way towards us, we saw that he had cuts and bruises on his face. He also gave off an unpleasant stench. I inquired about his face, as if he was also hurt. He assured us it was from hiking, as he loved spending time outdoors. He said he had a first aid kit back at his house, and as we were desperate, we obliged and followed him. It took us quite a while to reach his house, and when we did, he told us that we were welcome to rest there. Me and my friends were quite skeptical about this because his house did not look normal. It looked old and abandoned, and extremely unwelcoming. Me and my friends shared a look of uncertainty. However, my friend was yelping in pain. We settled her down on the couch in what seemed to be the living room. I noticed the room smelt of rotting meat, much like the stench that the man gave off. I opened the door, but to my surprise, the door was locked. I quickly ran to my injured friend, placing her upright. I told my friends that we needed to get the hell out of here right now. We heard the man approaching the door, singing a common French song that was recently part of a massive murder movie. I saw a window in the back room and rushed to it whilst holding back my tears. My friend started crying uncontrollably as she was thinking what I was thinking. I took a torch out of my backpack and repeatedly hit the window until it smashed. But I was greeted by the man with a kitchen knife and he started laughing and chasing me and my friends. But as I said before, my friend with the sprained ankle had fallen behind. I regret the very decision I made. I kept running and wiping my tears as I knew I had decided my friend's fate. We had reached my house, knowing we left behind our injured friend Abella. We called the police and they had searched the area of the house but no sign of Abella. She was pronounced missing a week after it happened and to this day, she is still missing. I have to live with that every day. Thank you for listening. I hope you share this, as it is important to know not to trust strangers.
My old college roommate, Dylan, lives just outside of Denver. Like most Colorado natives, he loves to camp. The crazy kind of camper who does it all year, even in December. Whenever he goes to the mountains alone, I have him check in with me just in case. I'm worried about him, so I'll get right to it. His texts are starting to scare me. The following is our latest text conversation. 2.30 p.m. Yo, just parked my car. Heading to the trail now. You're crazy, man. How cold is it? Not bad, actually. 30s. You gotta come out here soon. It's beautiful. Ha! We'll see you in spring when it warms up. Have fun, man. Watch out for staircases in the forest. Nice, dude. Real funny. 7.44 a.m. Dude, are you up? Yes, sir. You okay? This is so weird. I woke up this morning, and there's someone else out here? On the mountain? Looks like you're not the only winter camper, lol. No, not a camper. I can see them on the horizon, but they haven't moved. Like, at all. What? IDK, it definitely looks like a person, but they haven't moved. They're probably 300 yards away, but standing completely still. That's super creepy, dude. Keep me updated. 9.19 a.m. They still haven't moved. I made breakfast over the fire and acted like I didn't notice anything. I'm going to check it out. LGHT, let me know. Maybe it's a stump or something. 9.33 a.m. Dude, it's a fucking scarecrow. What? Like a farmer scarecrow? Yeah, man, what the fuck other kind of scarecrows are there? Its clothes are weird, though. How so? The clothes are modern. It's wearing a nice black jacket and jeans and stuff. Face is kind of scary. Burlap sack with black eyes and a huge smile stitched on. And why is this thing out here? I'm tempted to steal its North Face jacket, lol. I posted a picture of it on my Snap story if you want to see what it looks like. I don't know, dude. I'd leave it alone. Maybe it's some sort of conservation study or something. Like to see if bears will attack it. You might be on camera. And I know you have weed and shrooms on you. Ha, <laughs> good point. Speaking of which, time to pack a bowl. Lol. Have fun. Ha <laughs> ha. 3.33 a.m. Someone is outside my tent. I'm sure. Dude, please. This is serious. I can see their shadow. Call the police, Dylan. No. I don't want to make any noise. They probably think I'm asleep. I have my knife. I'm texting inside my sleeping bag so they can't see my phone light. I thought I heard a noise and I woke up. I guess I didn't zip up my tent all the way and I assumed it was the wind, but then I saw the silhouette. WTF, man? Should I call the police for you? Where are you? Latitude and longitude now. Dylan! Dude, please respond and drop a pin so I know where you are. 6.56 a.m. I'm all right. Thanks for finally responding. I was just about to have a heart attack. I barely slept. I was going to call the police or ranger station, but I don't know where you're at. There's something weird, though. The scarecrow is right outside my tent. Someone put it there last night while I was asleep. That's the shadow I saw. I don't like this at all. Go home, man. Seriously. That's messed up, even if it's a joke. I'm about four miles from my car. I'll text you when I get back to it. Also, I forgot to mention something. What? My hat was on top of the scarecrow this morning. Someone must have got into my tent last night while I was asleep and put my hat on its head. Text me ASAP. That was earlier. Hopefully he gets back okay. Three dots. It looks like he's responding. 9.13 a.m. Oh, shit. Someone slashed my tires. And there's another scarecrow by my car. Today I'm going to share with you a story that actually happened to me. So for the holidays, me and two of my friends decided to go and visit my friend's village. At night, on the second day, we decided to walk around the streets. The village was really quiet, and there were only a few houses in that area. It was a winter night, so the weather was very foggy and we couldn't see much in the distance. The roads we were walking on had trees lined up on both sides, 
and huge rice fields just beyond them. You can't see from one end to the other end, even in daylight. So as we were walking, one of our friends was getting super scared. I tried to scare him more by throwing small branches and sticks in the trees to make loud noises. At one point, he became quite furious at me, so I had to stop. After a few minutes of walking, we all heard something in the trees. I swore to my friends that it wasn't me, but they didn't believe me. A couple of minutes later, it happened again, and they clearly saw now that it wasn't me, and we all froze at the same time. We saw something drop from the tree and stand still facing us. We couldn't clearly see it due to the fog. We suddenly started to run in the opposite direction from where our house was. The thing went flying through the trees and landed a few meters ahead of us. We were shocked. But suddenly, a white figure came from behind us. It was an enormously sized man with a beard and white clothing. He told us to follow him and not to be scared. We were so scared we didn't think anything of it and started following him. When we were following him, we no longer saw the creature that had been following us earlier. Luckily, the guy lived right next to our house and told us not to go out at night. We told everyone everything the next morning, and they told us no one lives next to our house. That's when we packed our bags and left the village for good. This happened to an old lady in our area a few years ago. We used to live in Chal type area, where everyone's house was very near with each other. There was an old lady living with her son. In our area, everyone had a good relationship with each other, considering they went to school with each other. So sometimes they go to each other's houses to eat, especially a few of them who also worked together. One of them died because of a heart attack. After a few weeks of this, there was a knock on the door after midnight. That old lady's son was on a night duty that day, so she thought it was him. When she opened the door, she realized that it was one of her son's friends. So she asked him what he was doing here at this hour. He told her that he was hungry. She agreed and told him to come in. They chatted as he ate. After eating, he left saying goodbye to her. She also had gone to sleep after closing the door. After waking up, she was doing her daily routine while thinking what happened that night. When she replied in mind what had happened the night earlier, she was scared to the bone. Because she realized the one who came at night was none other than the man who died a few weeks ago. When she realized that, she told this to her son and her neighbors. After that, no one saw him, but to this day, we don't know why he came to the house that night. Some people say that maybe he wanted to eat his last meal. I'm 30 years old, but this happened to me when I was 19. I was staying in a hotel because I was visiting a university that I wanted to attend. After I unpacked everything, I went out to a restaurant to eat and then came back again around 8 p.m. I was checking out Instagram while laying down in bed. About an hour later, a strange alarm started going off in my room, along with a white light flashing in the corner of the ceiling. A message started repeating, saying something along the lines of, all guests remain in your rooms, this is a lockdown. I had never heard of a lockdown in a hotel room before. I didn't know hotels had alarms like this. I found it more interesting and exciting than anything else. Eventually, the alarm stopped, but the light kept flashing and the message kept repeating every 20 seconds. It was only like 9.30 p.m. So I decided to switch on the TV for some background noise while I was getting ready for bed. I shut the light off when I was done and laid down and watched TV for about a half an hour before turning it off. The light in the corner of the ceiling, along with the message, was definitely going to disturb my sleep. I was thinking of calling the reception to see what was going on. 
A minute later, the phone started ringing, so I picked it up and it was the reception. I was expecting them to tell me something about the alarm and when it would shut off, but instead, the person on the other end spoke in a very concerned voice. She told me to remain calm and walk out the door. So I took that opportunity to inquire about what was going on. She told me that there was someone in the room with me and to get out immediately. I got off the phone and started looking around everywhere. Part of me was in the fact curious to see if someone was actually in the room. I checked under the bed and the bathroom, but nobody was there. Then I noticed a closet next to the bathroom door. It was one of those closets with a wooden sliding door. It was open just a tiny bit, and through that tiny crack, I could see a person. At first, it wasn't really sinking in what I was seeing, but when the door slid shut, that was when I freaked out and ran out the door. The people at the reception desk showed me some security cameras from an hour earlier of some sketchy looking man walking around looking for a room. When he got to my room, he opened it with a card he somehow got, and that was it. I stayed around as the police came and took the person out. It was a man with brown hair, a top, and shorts. He looked like he was in his 40s, and he looked at me as he passed, as if he knew who I was immediately. It's scary thinking back that he might have been watching me for over an hour in that closet. Who knows what he would have done to me if I didn't get out of my room that second. 